cleaning your drink. Thank you, lady. We want to thank y'all for what y'all do for this congregation. Before I go any further, I know Jamison is chomping at the bit to get up here. Jamison Corral, dressed and bleeding, not he has come and see me. I, you know, I couldn't wait to get him back down here. I, I had him one time at, at our church, and we'll tell you about that later. I could talk 30 minutes about that. I kind of played a trick on him, and and uh, he won't never forget it, and I won't either. Okay, Jamison, he got his wife, his name Amy. They have two children, Ada Pearl and Little Sutton. They are a member of the North Warren Church of Christ. At this time, we want to turn it over to Brother Jamison. Say good morning to everyone here, and I, I want to say it's, a, it's just a blessing to be here. Um, I was asked a few years ago to come down and was unable to make it because of the death uh, of a good friend of mine. Uh, but I tell you what, it's a blessing here, and I can tell you, to go on and on, I can tell you about Ralph Boone, I can tell stories on Ralph, and, and, uh, and uh, just, I, I just want to say thank you for the love. Uh, I've got to know Lindell over the years. He's been a great influence to me, and I appreciate the work that he's done in our part of the country. I can say that about uh, the other speakers. I know I've spent some time with them, and uh, you've got some great speakers coming here in a minute. You know, in about 40 minutes, you'll have some good speakers up here. But uh, I'll do the best I can this morning. It's, a, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, I don't know why Lindell chose me for this topic, but I think I have a fairly good perspective on that from my background and what I do for a living on my day-to-day -day, uh, job and, and living. And I want to talk to you this morning about happiness is not found in riches, and not found in worldliness. The happiness that we're talking about today is not found in the physical things in this life, but spiritual things to come. And I'll just talk about that for a few moments, for a few moments this morning. I want to first get across the point to you this morning. There's a couple of misconceptions. This works a lot better when you turn it on. A couple misconceptions that I want to talk to you about this morning. I don't want you to tune me out. When, you, when we talk about worldliness and riches, you might say to yourself, well, I'm not a very wealthy person, so I'm going to turn this off right now. You know, this doesn't apply to me, but I assure you that it does. All people with wealth are not worldly. I want to tell you that this morning. All people that have physical wealth in this life are not worldly people. We've got brethren in the church that are very physically well off. They make a great living, a lot of income, and they are some of the most generous people that you'll ever meet in this life. Some of those people spend countless hours every week concerning themselves with the works of the church and taking care of those kind of things. So it doesn't mean just because you're rich, you're a worldly person. Also from that, all people who lack wealth are not holy. Just because you're poor does not give you a license to say, well, <laughs> I, I serve God because I don't have a lot of the world's goods. That's not an excuse either this morning. So I want you to think about that as we go through our study. There's a quote here uh, by John Piper. John Piper says, I am wired by nature to love the same toys that the world loves. I start to fit in. I start to love what others love. I start to call earth home. Before you know it, I call luxuries needs and using my money just the way unbelievers do. I begin to forget the war. I don't think much about people perishing. Missions and unreached people drop out of my mind. I stop dreaming about the triumphs of grace. I sink into a secular mindset that looks first at what man can do, not what God can do. It is a terrible sickness. And I thank God for those who have forced me again and again towards a wartime mindset. You know, that's you and I a lot of times. We get comfortable, we get rocked to sleep in this world from the comforts that we enjoy in this life, and we totally forget about the mission and about the war that's going on all around us. The war for souls and people to be brought to Christ, that they're dying and they're going to hell if they remain in the condition that they're in. We forget that oftentimes because we are so comfortable with the world and its things and its stuff and its junk, quite frankly. 
And this morning we're going to talk about those things. I want you to draw your minds this morning to the, the book of Mark chapter 4 verse 18 and 19 where we're going to take the text of our, our study today. The Bible says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Obviously, you know where this passage comes from. This comes from the, the parable of the sower. Uh, we know that some were sown uh, on the wasteland, some on stony ground, some on thorny ground, and some on good ground. And when we look at that, that, that passage, that parable, oftentimes we see ourselves as the sower, as the one that's sowing the seed. And obviously, it's our job to go and sow the seed. And, and we understand that if we sow uh, in different conditions, that different results spring up. And we always see ourselves as the sower. But brethren, at one time and even now, you and I are the ground. We are that soil. We are capable uh, of, of being stony and having places where the, the Word doesn't root in. We are capable of being thorny. And what the Bible says here, where the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things enter in. You know, brethren, that can be you and I today. We can let all those things come into our life and it'll choke us It'll choke us out and it'll take away the fruit that we're trying to bear. So let's think of ourselves with humility today and understand that we are capable of these things. Let's talk about the cares of this world. When we talk about worldliness, worldliness is defined as, as a concern with material things, material values of ordinary or ordinary life rather than a spiritual existence. And surely we look around the world and we see a whole lot of that going on around us. That people, and sometimes even Christians, are more concerned with the things that go on in this world from, from a good standpoint, from a pleasure standpoint, than the things that God would have us focus and concentrate on while we're in this war, while we live on this earth. People are concerned with all sorts of different things. People are concerned with physical possessions. All that's on their mind is how I can get more stuff, more stuff, more stuff. We'll talk about that a little more when we talk about the deceitfulness of riches. People want physical pleasure. They just want to feel good. They just want things to make them feel good. Brother Ian's going to talk to us this morning more about that. People want personal accomplishments. You know, I went to auction school with a fella. He was from East Tennessee, and, and we asked him why he was there to be an auctioneer. And he said, wallpaper. He just wanted another certificate on the wall for his personal accomplishments. He had already accomplished so much and done so many other things. And I guess he had a wall in his office full of certificates of things that he'd accomplished. You know, people, they, we want to do that in this life. We want to reach milestones and goals, and we want to be recognized and noticed, and that leads us to a higher social ranking. We want to be somebody in this life. We want the world to see us and maybe give us accolades and acclamation and, and, and laud in our name. The cares of this world, they are opposite with the concern of what God would have us concentrate on and what we would spend our time and thought in. The Bible says in John, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see, friend, these are totally two totally different concepts. Uh, someone once told me that you can't hold hands with God and kiss the devil at the same time. And surely you can't. You can't hold on to both sides. You can't serve two masters. It's impossible to do. And brethren, you and I, we have to make a decision in this life who we're going to serve. Are we going to serve our God? Are we going to serve our Creator? Are we going to serve the one that gives salvation? Are we going to fall into the trap and, and enjoy all the lust and all the things that this world has to offer for a short amount of time? In James chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoso, uh, whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. We're talking about happiness today and, and how to get true happiness and joy and satisfaction out of this life. If I told you today that you were God's enemy, that God despised you, that God hated you, would you feel joy and happiness and contentment and satisfaction in your heart today? No. If I told you today that you were the enemy of God, 
It would be the most disturbing thing that any man could ever tell you. You would want to go hide under a rock. You would want to hide your face far, far from the Lord. That's not a comfortable place to be. That's not a comfortable place to live. There's no happiness that dwelleth there. Being the enemy of God, being uh, persuaded and being carried away by all the cares that are in this world. This has gone on for a long time. In Matthew chapter 20, uh, 24, verse 37, the Scripture says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For, is it, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not the flood came and took them away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The same thing was going on in the days of Noah. There was no righteousness in the world. Everyone was doing what was on their heart. Everyone was uh, concerned and carried away by the cares of this world. And there came a day that destruction came and all that was washed away. Sin was taken away. And the warning is that there is a day coming just like that. That there's going to be people on this earth in America in whatever year it is. And they're going to be eating and drinking. They're going to be marrying and getting in marriage. And there's going to be destruction come because they never saw the end coming. They never gave it a second thought. They just did what felt good. They did what pleased them. And that is the warning today that you and I have to take. Luke chapter 21 in verse 34. Take heed yourselves lest, any, uh, lest, any, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting or carousing and drunkenness. And listen, the cares of this life. There's going to be people that are going to be concerned with the cares of this life and so that day comes upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Take heed, brethren. Be warned today that there's a day coming that man, they're going to be doing what man does. Christians are going to be doing what Christians do. And there's going to be a day come that all this shall surely end. I'll tell you what. I want to tell you this today that if all you care about today is the pleasures of this life, if that is your only goal, it is that if that's your only form of happiness that you find, brethren, I hope you get all you can get while you're on this earth. If that's your goal. I hope, you get, I hope you get your belly full. I hope you get satisfied because there's a day coming that it's all coming to an end. Brethren, I warn you, don't have that attitude today. Don't be that person that wants to get full on this life and forget the next. Don't be caught in that trap as so many are. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, Thou therefore endure hardness, the hardness of one's heart, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, we remember that we're in a war. We've been given the gospel armor. We've been told to uh, watch the devil. He, he comes around like a, a roaring lion. He sneaks around. You know, if I knew that there was a lion anywhere close to here, I think it would make me very aware, wouldn't it, you? I think about the men in, that, that went over to Vietnam back in the 1960s, and they experienced a type of warfare that was uh, that was a little new to the world, guerrilla warfare. They didn't know what was hiding in the next tree or behind the next bush. They had to be aware. Could you imagine being a soldier at that time and walking through the jungles there uh, in Vietnam and hearing a, a twig snap a few yards away? Very aware, very cautious of their surroundings. Brethren, it's no different today. You and I are in a war. The devil, he's trying to hide out. He's trying to ambush us, to ambush us at every turn. You and I, being a, a good soldier of the Lord, we ought to be very aware of those things. We ought to be watching out for those signs and signals that danger can be lurking around every corner. He goes on to say, no man that warreth, no man that is in this fight, that is in this battle, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. No good soldier spends all his time trying to make sure his uniform is all pretty and clean. No, no, soldier, no, no good soldier uh, spends time on their, their personal appearance, do they? A good soldier, he gets ready for battle. 
He gets ready for the war. He gets ready to take on the enemy, whatever the enemy tries to throw it in. You and I, we don't need to worry about some things in this life that we worry about, do we? There's some things that are really unimportant in this life. Whether I uh, wear a tie or don't wear a tie, it really doesn't matter. No, and that's okay that you wore one, Ralph and Mike and, and Bruce. I'm not, you know, trying to knock on guys that wore ties. But it really doesn't matter. You know, the, the job that I have to do right now is to preach the word, and that's what matters. You know, it doesn't really matter what type of car that you drive to the Bible study, but it matters that you go and do Bible studies. That's important. That's okay, but you don't have, you don't have to take it off. I'm trying to shine nobody. But, brother, we get, we get carried away. Uh, stuff that the world says is important, it's foolishness. It's worthless. And oftentimes our mind gets carried away in those things that don't even matter and we forget about the battle that's in front of us. He tells us, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world. This world is not worth conforming to. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is what I'm shooting for. That is what I want. I want, to, I want the Lord to see me as good. I want the Lord to accept me. I want to see the, the Lord look at me and say, He is complete. He has done everything that I would have Him to do inside my will. The cares of this world often burden us, brethren, with a lot of undue burden. It's like hitching to a wagon. We have no business or reason carrying around. It's worthless. Do you know what we really, I think this hits probably closer to home, is the, the deceitfulness of the riches of this world. Everybody has a job. Everybody's trying to get stuff. I don't care what your, uh, what your background is, what kind of income you make. Everybody wants to get more stuff, it seems. I know that because being in the auction business, that's what I do. I, I trade assets all the time. I take stuff from Mike and I sell it to Dean. That's what I do. And it happens constantly. I saw this article. kind of made me smile. Make America Great Again. Now look how great is spelled. G-R-A-T. Okay? Make America Great Again. There's 1.4 billion pounds of surplus cheese in the United States. Now that makes me really happy. Because I really like cheese. You could probably put cheese on one of these songbooks and I'd probably try to eat it anyway. You know, cheese has that effect on us. It's the, it hits the same receptors in the brain that heroin does. And so, yeah, and that, I'm not kidding. You can become addicted to cheese. It is so good. We are so richly blessed in this country, it's not even funny. But what uh, oftentimes do we do with the richness that we enjoy in this land? Well, we become a little bit like this fellow. Just trying to cram it all in. Just trying to see how much of it exactly we can collect. I had an apprentice, I have an apprentice in Tennessee, and he had the opportunity to sell this estate of this man who uh, inherited money from the Bonnaroo farm. Now, you probably, I don't know how much you know about Bonnaroo in this part of the country, but it's a big music festival held on several acres in Manchester, Tennessee. And so he was a, a beneficiary of that sale. And so he had millions of dollars. And he was a state trooper. And I'm going to tell you this guy, I got to go to this fellow's house before they started cleaning it up. And there was a big, nice, two-story brick house there in a nice subdivision. And I'm going to tell you, you walked in that house and there were just little bitty paths to walk through. Just almost, I, there were some rooms that I was too big to fit in because there was so much stuff in this place. He used to line it up outside of his driveway, uh, going to the, the, the road and covering tarps. He had so much stuff. He had storage buildings full of stuff. He couldn't walk on his porches full of stuff. You couldn't, when you went to his bathrooms, this guy, he liked to read. He read a book a day, they said. And you would walk in this huge bathroom with these huge tall ceilings, and, and half of the room would be books. 
piled to the ceiling in the bathroom. Stuff everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. You know what they said about this man? They said that he was a religious man. They said that any time you want to talk to him, he wanted to talk about the Lord, talk about Jesus. You know, the Bible says, what is a man profit? He shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, if I could somehow get my name on every deed of property in this world, what would it be worth? I guess I would enjoy it for a short amount of time until the time of my death. But what's it worth if we could have it all? It's worth nothing. What could we trade? What would be a barter system? Uh, what could we trade that would be worth our soul? What, what could we get in return that would be worth our eternal soul? Can you think of anything? Can you have imagined anything this morning that you could take and trade and that you could have the, the desires of your heart in exchange for this one soul that was given to you by God? The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therefore, with, uh, therewith, uh, let us be therewith content. But they that which fall be, uh, they that which will be rich fall into temptation and snare, and many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The love of money being the root of all evil. Oftentimes we can see problems in this world that we, that we watch on the news and we see destruction and, and trouble with people. And oftentimes it's because somebody somewhere else wanted to make a buck. War, had, war has been fought because there was somebody that thought they could get rich doing something and war broke out. That is the far reaches of the war that man has and the, the love of money that drives that kind of evil and passion. And brethren, it is dangerous. We take the example of the scripture in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, the story of the rich young ruler. And behold, one, man, uh, one came and said to him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt not do murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and mother. And thou, shalt, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept up uh, from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said to him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you about that, you know, what, he, what Jesus finally told him there. I want to say there's a little hope there. Because Jesus says that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, there's nothing wrong in this world with being blessed with, with possessions. You know, I, I knew a guy in Kentucky, I met a farmer one time, and it just so happened that his great-great-grandpappy parked the, parked the wagon over this particular piece of property. And when the coal company came in and started uh, going underground getting that coal, he said, since that time, we have yet to have a month that the coal company didn't write us a check for $100,000. A month, $100,000. Now, that's not any, that's not green, is it? He couldn't help that that's where his great-great-grandpappy parked the wagon. Just happened to be over that Kentucky coat. <laughs> Wish my great-great-grandpappy did that. He got lost and he parked it on a cave. <laughs> There's nothing in those things. 
you know, there's nothing wrong with having being blessed in that kind of a way, being uh, able to have that kind of possession. Maybe, maybe you're from Oklahoma or Texas, and you know your great great grandpappy parked over some oil. Maybe that's the case. I don't know. That's not a bad thing. That's not trying to be greedy and take. But he said this: that you know, when when one does become rich, hardly a person because of the love of money is the root of all evil. It's hard for that person to sometimes let go of that love. It's hard to let them let go of that money. You know, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 19, I think this kind of tells the heart, lay not up yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust up to rub, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth, uh, moth nor rust up to rub, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I told you about that man who we did as a state sale. He had all that stuff in his house. And he talked about the Lord and talked about religion. But I don't know if he ever came across this verse. Because I can't judge the man's heart. I never met him. But it sure does look like the treasure that he had was on this earth. Because every afternoon after work, he would go to antique malls and he would buy stuff to take back home. You know, oftentimes the litmus test that you and I face, we can look at our lives and we can look where we spend our money and where we spend our time and we can figure out by those two things where our heart is. I knew a man that all he wanted to do on Sunday was go to flea markets. And he wanted to go buy stuff and he would find little treasures and bring them home. You know, his heart was in that. That's where his treasure was. And he didn't give one minute about thinking about the Lord. He had nothing no, nothing he wanted to do with it. Where's your treasure today? Where are you laying up treasure today? Is it in your garage? Is it in your outbuildings? Is it all throughout your house? Is it dirt laying on top of the earth? Is that what your treasure is today? I think Moses is a great example that we can all take from in Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says in verse 23, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months with his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. What you think about Moses? Moses was put in that one of those predicaments that he had really no choice of being a child. He had no choice in the matter that he was going to be raised in the house of Pharaoh. That's just something that kind of fell on Moses. And Moses grew up in the house of Pharaoh. And you, can you imagine having that kind of richness and that kind of power, knowing that, that anything that you wanted... Anything you desire could be yours. And, and probably not have to work real hard for it. Anytime you wanted to raise your hand or raise your finger and point at something, it could be yours. Knowing that maybe eventually you would be Pharaoh and that you would have control and that you would have power over the people. Can you imagine being in that type of situation and, and having that opportunity to have all that and to be all that? Moses said, you know what? I'd rather serve God. I'm going to forsake those riches. I'm going to forsake that power. And I'm going to go take these people and I'm going to go and do exactly what God would have me to do with these people. Rick, could we say the same thing about our lives? Given to have that opportunity of riches and power, would we make the same decision? I'll tell you what, it was no cakewalk what Moses had to go through. Dealing with people is difficult. My mentor told me the other day, you know, we were talking about taking on apprentices and teaching people uh, how to do this business. And he told me this. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep this till I die. And he was very, very straightforward about this. He said, having apprentices is like being pecked to death by chickens. <laughs> and surely Moses felt that way. Walking through the wilderness, hearing these people complain and whine, it surely had to be feel like being pecked to death by chickens. But Moses saw the big picture, didn't he? Moses was not going to conform to this world. He said, you know what, these riches, they're just earthly riches. He said, but I want something eternal. I want something that lasts. 
You know, in Proverbs, the Bible says uh, in 11, 28, he that trusteth in, in his riches shall fall. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall fl uh, flourish like a branch. You know, people want to follow this all the time, don't they? They want to follow that money. You know, the, the, the reality is, somebody have a full bank account? You might raise your hand that your bank account is full. Easy. <coughs> Bank accounts don't get full, do they? You can't put too much in a bank account. You can't ever fill them up. Now, you can't empty one. I'm, I'm witness of that. You can have an empty bank account, but you never can have a full one. You know, with this idea that we chase more and more, just making another dollar, another dollar, another dollar, you know what that's really worth at the end of the day? It's really worth that. At the end of your days, if all of your life you chase that almighty dollar, you might as well have a bank account full of these. Worthless. Get you nowhere after this life is over. We have a warning here. Paul warns Timothy. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. They that do good, they that be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now don't close me off yet, brethren. Don't think we're talking about all them super, super wealthy people. Oh yeah, yeah, them wealthy people, they ought to be rich in good works. They ought to be ready to distribute, ready to communicate. Brethren, they're ta he's talking here. He's giving heed and giving warning to you and I. We are some of the wealthiest people on the entire planet. They're sitting in this room right now. Some of the richest people on the entire planet. Brethren, it's a warning to you and I that if you've been blessed, and we have been blessed, we need to be rich in good works. We need to be ready to distribute. We'd be ready to communicate, ready to share those things that we've given, that we've been given. You think about the works that uh, that Brother Mike does, and he goes to Nigeria, a place uh, that's just poor as it can be, where 40 or 50 dollars a month would support an evangelist going out and doing the gospel. Brethren, I, I had a lunch, uh, uh, I had a supper last night that cost that. I could have preached the God. I could have had somebody go preach the gospel a whole month in Nigeria for what supper we ate last night. Brethren, that's where we've gotten off. We've got all this stuff. We've been taken about with the cares of this world. And we've been with, unwilling to share that with people that really need it. There's not too many acts of uh, conversion that we don't see that's preceded by an act of benevolence. If we could be a heart, a people with a heart of benevolence, people that were ready to give and ready to share and, and show that love and, and share that blessing that God's given us, we could change the world. We could change our communities. We could change our churches. We could have people come in by the droves because of our hospitality and our love. The last thing here this morning, the lust of other things. Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I want you to think about this morning, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I think it's much of the framework. It's been something that's been on my heart lately about the framework of why I sin, why I fall away, why I'm uh, deceived and tempted. It's because I see things, they look good to me, I think I can draw pleasure from them. The lust of the, of the flesh, uh, the lust of the eyes, I look at those things, I desire them, I covet them in my heart. And I look at those things and think if I had those things, I would be better off. I, I, my pride takes the best of it. But the, the warning is very clear here. In James chapter 1, verse 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. You think about Eve in the garden. She saw that fruit. 
She saw that it was good. It was pleasing to the eyes. It would bring her pleasure. She coveted it, and the lust of the flesh, she desired to have it. Or, excuse me, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, she desired to have it. And the pride of life, that it would make her wise. And sin conceived. We could say the same thing about David's sin with Bathsheba, but the same things fall into place, and the sins oftentimes that carry us away, the same thing is true. We look at it, we think it's good, we desire to have it, and that it would make us better off. But that, friend, leads to death. If you want to be consumed with all the things, all the pleasures in life, in this life, it brings forth death. Solomon, he had the same experience in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 10. And whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked at all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. All these things, Solomon was one of those men that could point to something and it could, he could have it. Or point to something and it would be done. And he said after all his life, he looked at all those things. He said it's just worthless. Just absolutely worthless. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk, and uh, so as ye have us for an example, example, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and I tell you even weeping, that ye are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. What happens when a man minds earthly, earthly things? It says their end is destruction. He said there's no... Pass and go, there's no collecting $200. Their end is destruction. He says their God is their belly. Their God, the thing that they serve, the thing that they worship, is right here. It's their own pleasure. It's their own desire. Their glory, what they think is their glory, their adoration, that, that lifting up of themselves, it's really shame when it comes down to it in the sight of God. When man, he looks at himself, and he says, I'm going to please myself. It's all worthless in the sight of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. There's that war again. He calls us strangers and pilgrims. Don't get comfortable here. This fleshly world is not your home. You know, when I'm at home, I, I get comfortable. I take off my shoes. I lay in my favorite chair. It's my home. It's my comfort place. He says, this world, brethren, is not the place to take off your shoes and sit in your easy chair. Don't get too comfortable here. This world is fleeting. It's passing away. And one day it will be destroyed. And in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. Brethren, don't get too carried away by the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of its riches, and the lust of other things. What happens with us, though? When we do fall into this trap, that we get comfortable, that we get carried away with all those things, brethren, indifference sets in. Indifference is not really caring one way or the other. Just kind of being. Just kind of going with the flow. We see that in the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. The Bible says unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things said the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art, that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thy sap, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and be zealous therefore and repent. Now I want to tell you a little bit about Laodicea just for a second. Laodicea was a very wealthy place. It was a place much like the United States of America today. In A.D. 60, there was a great earthquake that occurred in Laodicea. 
and, and their, their water supply was knocked out, and they had a lot of issues, obviously you can imagine, from an earthquake, but they never asked for any, any financial help from the Roman uh, government at that time. They had enough money they could do it all themselves. So they built this about five or six mile aqueduct that came into the city that would produce them water, and the water obviously that came through that source was a, a, a lukewarm water, it's room temperature. At Laodicea at this time, they had a banking industry that was thriving. They were good bankers in that, in that type of way. They, they, had this, uh, they had black sheep there in the region, and they produced this beautiful, glossy black wool in Laodicea, this beautiful uh, raiment. And they also had this medical school, you know, slash hospital place, and they, they uh, specialized in eyes and ears. And so when he's talking to the church of Laodicea, he's speaking their language here. In verse 17 there, he says, Because thou sayest, I am rich. Oh yeah, Laodicea, you, you think you're very well off. And they were financially. And increase with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable. And he says they're poor. There are a lot of bankers in Laodicea. They knew how to deal with money. He said they're poor. And blind. These people, they created an eye salve. They, they knew about the, the science and, and the health of the eye. He said, you're blind. And then he says, you're naked. He said, you know, you've got this pretty uh, black wool that everybody's dressing in. He said, but you're naked. You've taken yourself and you've, you've thrown yourself that everything this world has, this worldly goods, these worldly desires, and he said, you're empty. Perhaps that's why he continues and says, I counsel thee to buy gold of me tried in the fire. Perhaps he's talking about the banking industry. That thou mayest be rich in white raiment instead of this black raiment that they could produce. That thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve. Perhaps he's talking about that medical school that thou mayest see. He said, you know, you've involved yourself with all this other stuff, but it's not what I want you to be involved in. He said, you've taken all these things, you've been good in the world, you've succeeded in this world, but you failed with me, your God. You know, perhaps that's where we're at in this country. We have all this stuff, we enjoy all these pleasures, and perhaps it's taken us away to a place that God looks at us and says, well, you failed. He said, you think you're rich, you're nothing. You think you're clothed beautifully, you're naked. You think you can see, you're as blind as a bat. There's no happiness that comes with these things. There's no lasting happiness and satisfaction that comes with these things. And finally, brethren, the last scripture I want to give you this morning. We see in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon continues to lament. In verse 14, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happened to us, happened to them all. What event is that? Then said not my heart, as it happened to the fool, so it happened even to me. And why was I, why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity, for there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that how which is now and the days to come shall all be forgotten and die. And how died the wise man as the fool? I want you to think about this. Therefore I hated my life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all his vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. He said, I gained all these things, and somebody else is going to take it. I want to tell you, brethren, one day you're going to die, and you're going to have accumulated a lot of stuff in your life. And I'm going to tell you where we're at with millennials, I can preach about you know, the auction industry, but they don't want your stuff. They go to Amazon when they want stuff. But, you know, a state auction still happen. And so we're going to have an estate auction. They're going to hire somebody like me to come to your house. And you know what's going to happen? We're going to take all that stuff and we're going to line it up in a pretty road. Joyce, there's your tractor. I put that in last night especially for you. And you're going to take all those things that you've worked for all your life. You're going to take a place. Maybe you bought a home one time and you put it on a 30-year mortgage and you worked every day and you paid that mortgage payment for 30 years. Then you bought this house and this piece of land. And I'm going to take all the things that you collected, all those things that you thought were important. Everybody's got little collections, don't they? I'm going to take all that stuff 
and I'm going to put them and I'm going to line them up in a row and I'm going to do some hooping and hollering and fast talking and I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to take everything that you work for, all these worldly possessions, all your life, and in one day, in eight hours, I'm going to take them and they're going to belong to somebody else. All that labor that you put in, in one day, I'm going to liquidate it and it's going to belong to somebody else. Maybe people you don't even like. They're going to own your stuff. So brethren, you tell me how important is this world's goods? Where's the happiness? Where's the satisfaction in that? If you want to work, how about we work for something that's worth working for? Something that's last and something that's eternal. Instead of all this junk that's sitting around. Brethren, I appreciate your attention. God bless you.